All right, thank you, Andrew, and thanks everybody to um, talk about your ideas. Um, I am a senior staff architect uh, in VMware, and, um, especially working on sustainability solutions. So my role is really to pull ideas together and put that into production. Not myself, but ask the right team to do that work. And sometimes it is uh, not forward, sometimes it's uh, upward, <laughs> so it's super difficult. And all the credits for this talk are going to my uh, colleagues uh, uh, in city office. And I really learned a lot from this uh, workshop. And I think I can connect more dots more. But I'm not going to repeat whatever you said. Otherwise, <laughs> you'll feel boring because the ideas are really from the uh, industry and also researchers. So I hope that I can share the uh, productization point of view and also some learnings from my side. Not a roadmap or uh, milestones, but how we, all of us work together from partnership with industry and bringing your research ideas into real production. So without further ado, let me first tell you what we need to really drive that forward. The first thing is really to convince the leadership in the industry so that it can support the work. Now we hear you at this data, we shared with our leadership team and they, they said, oh yes, it's our responsibility, we have to move forward. Right? The good news here is that we are not alone and a lot of companies are making a lot of commitment. 38% uh, of Fortune Global 500 companies made their 2030 sustainability target. It is up from 25% last year. So the next question is, what should we do and what can we do to make this number reach around 100 percent I'm opportunistic, but probably we need more data to convince all the uh, companies because otherwise, how do we reach zero? Well, what are these targets? Um, what are the real goals that we need to set up for? Um, I can give you one example of VMware's 2030 agenda. We have 30 goals for ESG and the listed goal here are for sustainabilities. It is not about only the net zero operations for our own data centers, for our own company, but about the innovations in our product and services, because we want to help using our software to help the customers reach their uh, sustainability goals. What I call that is sustainability as a service. So today our talk is mainly focusing on this aspect. How do we build sustainability into the product and the services? The continued last slide. Now I said that we need to get leadership uh, commitment and your work, research work actually helped a lot with the data and then we can convince our leadership. But then we need to create a vision to convey that, yes, we can do that. So what is the vision for VMware? Uh, I call it intrinsic sustainability. The purpose here is that we want to convince that everybody, every stakeholder could contribute good sustainability into their product and services. Together, then we can build a zero carbon SDDC platforms. And that lines with our any, any strategy, meaning that we can build sustainability into any device for any application running on any cloud. What does that mean? That means we want to build, enable the developers to build their carbon efficient applications. We also want to enable the IT of the means so they can operate their IT infrastructure more efficiently in carbon as well. And the last but not least, can we build more things into our management stack, the metrics like you have talked about? And further, if we can do analytics to help the operators to reduce their carbon emission. And this is another angle we have to address because you can see that a lot of work is not only technical, but also human. So that's the institutional barriers we need to talk about next. Now with that, uh, I'm not going to repeat it because it's the same as we have talked about renewable energy and resource efficiency and embodied carbon. So we need to move forward with all those categories. And uh, for the rest of the talk, let's reduce the problem a little bit more onto virtualization, civil consolidation and the migration. How do we use, uh, realize these pillars in using these technologies or advance these technologies? And the first thing we need to do is really metrics. Uh, I think last session was talking about metrics. That's super critical. We have to make the measurable to control it. And we are using, we're trying to follow the SCI model for uh, energy consumption and embodied carbon. Um, our focus here is VMs and hosts from last slide, right? The host, we really need to get a measurement uh, metrics, uh, but as somebody was saying that we don't have the metrics for all devices. Uh, CPU, I think we made a lot of uh, uh, progress with Intel and Dell and other companies, but other devices like storage and other things, we perhaps need more measurement. Um, 
And with this host measurement, the other question that people would ask here is, how do you handle the workloads? And how do we attribute the VM, attribute the host uh, power consumption to VMs and to further workloads? And we also think about what if we can virtualize the power performance counters, so your REPL uh, interface can read the counters as if it, the application is running on uh, physical hardware. So we can talk about that offline if you have more interest, and maybe there's a collaboration point as well. So what I'm trying to say here is that there is some, a lot of work to do uh, from measurement, from modeling, and we are lack a lot of data. From a research point of view, yes, we can make assumptions and the proposal is there, but we do not actually have the data without partnership with uh, like the utility companies, with the hardware vendors and with software vendors as well. So I would call it really a collaboration between all the vendors and all the stakeholders. Okay, so the next part is actually something that you always, uh, um, a lot of you are talking about demand shifting and we need to get the data again from the utility companies about the distributed energy a generation and a curtailment so that we can feed it into a scheduler that you can decide where and when to run the workloads. This seems so good. But the reality is that there are, sorry, there are a lot of uh, complexities. For example, data gravity, multi-tenancy, cost-benefit analysis, and the interaction with grid. How can you solve all those problems? Right? Without solving that problems, uh, you are reducing the scope of your application. And then that gets to my last question about what are the use cases? Uh, functional service probably is a use case, but what other use cases? Is functional service really the, uh, the, uh, the future or covers most of the workloads? I tend to say no, <laughs> uh, but maybe it has a bigger portion. Uh, what we work on uh, from our CTO office is that they were thinking about the edge use cases. So this diagram shows you the edge deployment. You have to have some local renewable resource in every data center is in a separate location. And there is a scheduler, the automation that can lock the data, make the uh, right placement. And what we want to think about is that it's not a separate scheduler, but a scheduler we already have, for example, for performance and latency. I think uh, Professor Tan was talking about the same as well. We need to add more uh, about carbon and energy into it. And we need to make sure that the operators and the, the uh, users really care about that, then they will enforce these policies. So this is edge. Now we talked about um, renewable energy. So the, the next piece is resource efficiency. And a lot of you are talking about the resource efficiency problems and on prime data centers. We did a uh, kind of a sampling of our customers' data center environments. And you can see that 80% of the servers using less than 30% of CPUs. So that's a lot of waste. There are really a lot of reasons into it because uh, one big reason is like the industry, um, the IT administrators want to overbook, <laughs> purchase more hardware uh, than they necessary to have um, for backup capacities or also for uh, HAs, high availability, all those reasons, right? But that really limits the resource utilization. And even worse, because a typical server has these uh, energy proportionality problems, if you have less lower CPU utilization, that also means your energy efficiency is low. So that's very unfortunate. Unfortunate. We need to innovate in these areas. And even worse, the human side also plays an effect. So this is a study done by Stanford and the Amphysis in 2015. They found that there are a lot of zombie VMs and zombie hosts. And the hosts and VMs are running there. Actually, nobody cares the results. Nobody actually, uh, maybe it's, there's nobody owning that system anymore. But it's there, it's just a waste of resource. It's a huge waste. That brings to our second pillar about the efficiency usage. And we talk about, we talk about reducing waste, but what if we can collaborate with uh, public clouds uh, in a hybrid environment uh, for hyperscaler, making use their more efficient uh, uh, data centers and the, their advantage in using uh, purchasing this renewable energy and do more things, fancy stuff in the public cloud, right? that we can do uh, on-demand allocation of resource on the public cloud. So get the benefit of both uh, private cloud and public cloud. There are more uh, use cases in there, and I think it's a huge op uh, opportunity for us to collaborate. And also what to call out saying that the application is actually in the hands of the developers. How do we enable them to write applications in a more efficient way? How do we have more specialized software 
and hardware stack. Maybe library is something that we need. <laughs> um, of course, the power management is another interesting part. Now, without getting into that much detail, the third pillar is uh, uh, about uh, embodied carbon. I'm not talking about how do we measure it. These are important to start with, but I want to fill in one more gap, right? Yes, we need to measure it, we need to track it, but afterwards, we need to think a way, really reduce it, maybe to zero. And people talk about the prolonged life of their hardware, but how about reuse, repair, recycle, all other R, all other words starting with R, um, to build a circular economy. And this is again not one single company's job. That needs a lot of companies to work together, needs a lot of innovation, not only in technical sense, but also in finance and the business models. So this is the, another pillar in embodied carbon, so the beyond the, the metric itself. But again, we do need to start with metrics. Uh, we don't have too much metrics, probably we don't have enough metrics to really move forward. The first pillar, again, I'll get back to the institutional uh, barriers. And in the very beginning, I talked about execution, that we need leadership and the vision and the support from the top. But afterwards, they really will ask us is, how do we do that? And re I really like today's workshop because that gives us information. And uh, I hope that we can translate and implement that into best practice papers or tools using metrics or standards. Then that will lower the bar for us to implement that in our product. So that's the second piece in the barriers, but there's more. So how do we really make sure the work will go forward? <laughs> there are resistance. Um, companies are doing a lot of work uh, for other business reasons. If we ask them to do one more, say sustainability, right? There may be some pushback. You will get a lot of friends, but there are also people busy. Then how do we make this as a culture in our software development? How do we use processes or policies to, to enforce that and have in, incentives to encourage that. So that's another angle. And the last one is about cost. We cannot ignore cost. <laughs> uh, there's a paper, uh, I heard that you talk about the cost and the uh, carbon are different. Uh, yes, they are different. And I hope that there is a way to align them, um, to encourage that using, uh, optimizing for sustainability. Sometimes we can use regulation, we can use regulation, everybody have voices and can vote for that. But sometimes we can also, we can also emphasize the benefits, like social benefits. And we can also find ways to reduce the cost so that it is easier for us to scale the, your technology, your solutions into the product, into customers' hands. So with that, I'll end my talk. Uh, I didn't bring too much information here, but I just want to say, really glad to be here and I hope we can have a very good collective effort through innovation and research, build a partnership, and also bring up the awareness to general audience. And thank you. Thanks, Zilong. Uh, any questions for Zilong? All you guys are thinking, I'm gonna take advantage of having the mic here to thank Tom and George, who hopefully is still on the call for organizing the workshop. Thank you, guys. Thank you. This has been terrific. And thank VMware for sponsoring uh, the workshop. Appreciate it, guys. OK, come on. Now we're the questions. I can do card tricks while you're thinking about it. Um, so in one of your slides, you had this nice Venn diagram. Uh, okay, you had this nice Venn diagram, but I wasn't sure it was to scale. And I don't know if you could maybe comment on the degree to which. Let me see, what, uh, which one? Uh, otherwise, anyway, at some point you you had this description of how what a how much for example the building over the embodied carbon in the building versus the embodied carbon in the servers or the total power consumption for everything and it, are those the scale or are they are they, is that misleading like, like oh, not <laughs> it's not at the right scale um it's just a way to put this data text in the in the chart um, we do need to have a very good measurement on that. Uh, buildings are very difficult. 
even servers and the uh, uh, devices are difficult because not all the vendors provided this data. Uh, right now, what we can do is like reading some um, information, some document, for example, from Dell and HPE, understand what is that embodied carbon. What I hope that if we have some, so everybody is providing a service that you can, I mean, everybody, if we have a common service that everybody can inject that data into a common service that people can read it. You know? Or if it's not common service, then if we have an open source project that we can ask companies to add their data into it, then it becomes a standard that um, people can leverage the same effort to implement that and also collect data. But really right now it's a lack of data is a really a problem for us to move forward in production. We can go ahead with certain samples, but there is, they, we need some effort to expand the work across the industry. Sure, let me do a follow up. Um, it's a sort of a Star Trek four question. Uh, suppose you needed to guess, not, you know, what, what would your guess be? Like, it seems very important to, for the community to know the answers to these questions. So, okay, great, we can get the answers sometime in the future, but we have to do work now, assuming there's an answer to this question. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't know, maybe you, you aren't willing to give a guess. But I think you asked a very good question. Um, but as an engineer, I want to turn the question back to the researchers. <laughs> Can you give me the answers? Uh, well, uh, there's, yeah, there's something that I, I want to say, because uh, it's a different uh, one. As I, I remember somebody mentioned that in earlier talk already. For embodied carbon, people uh, may be caring more about the user, end user devices, if you talk about devices because uh, embodied carbon uh, are more of uh, uh, like, I think it's number is like 80% or 70% of a total carbon emission like compared to the operational. The embodied, embodied carbons are um, the big portion for the end user devices. For servers, um, the big portion is the operational. But the question you asked is about the buildings that I don't have information. So if we can really think about how do we collect those data with, uh, <laughs> <laughs> now IT industry, then it'll be an interesting issue to solve. So, so Zilong, let me ask you a different question, right? So we started the day with the keynote from Google, uh, which is an integrated provider, right? They deliver their own services. They deliver cloud services, right? They build their own data centers. They pick the location of their data centers and so on, right? In many ways, VMware is different, right? Um, I don't know that I can, I want to characterize sort of all the ways in which VMware is different, but certainly I don't know of any large, you know, sort of multi-billion dollar consumer facing services that VMware provides, nor do I think most of the data centers in which your software runs were designed by you. So I'm curious, you know, how that makes the problem different for you guys. Is it, is it, yeah. it has more constraints or do you have different opportunities or? Mm -hmm. or the like? mm -hmm. It creates some challenges for us because we don't, own the construction of the data centers. We are providing softwares for them to operate the data centers. And in the past, we were saying uh, software defined data centers. It means compute storage network. But how do we handle the uh, non-IT facilities like fans, right? And other things that uh, maybe, I mean, you talk, I think you talked about cooling or somebody talked about cooling, like how do we do that? That actually creates another opportunity for us to work with uh, those vendors. We have projects on that. It's called Flowgate and Deep Cooling. So essentially, it's a partnership with third party tools. We can collect their data uh, from them and we also work with other third parties to provide a, a machine learning based algorithms for them to cool the places uh, at the right time and place. So to us, it's more of a partnership with different vendors at this moment to extend our uh, footprint to the building, uh, building part. Perfect, thank you. So I'm gonna give the floor to Tom, I think, to decide what to do about the next session. Or...